Hi everyone, I wanted to make this video to show you how to do homework for, or how I did homework for anyway. So let me uh, go ahead and get started. Let me share my screen up here. So homework four is this guy, probability one. Uh, we wanna do all these things. Uh, I'm gonna leave you to, to read this, I'm gonna read my notes on this, uh, but I'm gonna just be doing uh, doing these guys here as well as the, the bonus problem. Um, yeah, let me, uh, let's just, uh, let's get straight into it. Oop, new share here. All right, so we're gonna start with problem two. Oops, we're good. We're gonna start with problem two. All right, so two through five are these guys. So we've got uh, a box that has 12 hats, 15 noisemakers, 10 finger traps, and five bags of confetti. So H is hat, N is noisemaker, F is finger trap, C is confetti. Probability of H is just the probability of picking a hat out of the box. So if we add these up, by the way, um, 12, 15, 10, and five is uh, 42. So probability of H is 12 hats out of the 42, so it's 12 out of 42. And 15 out of 42, F is what, 10 out of 42, and C is five out of 42. And you just do the division, you just literally 10 divided by 42, that'll give you a percentage, et cetera. Uh, you don't even really have to do the percentages I usually do because that's more, that's clearer for most people, but you could certainly just leave them as fractions if you wanted to. Yeah, um, 34. What is the word for the set of all possible outcomes? Uh, it's an interesting way to put that. It's not the word, it is the, the term. It's two words, sample space. Sample space is all the possible outcomes. Uh, conditional probability, it's kind of a vague question, but basically conditional probability is a restriction of your sample space. Um, instead of considering all the possible outcomes, you're considering all the outcomes that fit a certain uh, certain restriction, right? That's what the given is, right? So if we're finding the probability of A given B, then we are thinking of just the events in B as our, or excuse me, just the outcomes in B as our samples, as our new sample space. So we're restricting the original sample space down to just B. So you can you can say that a lot of different ways, but that's, that's my way of saying it, I think. Um, 40, uh, where are we at? E and F are mutually exclusive events. Probability of E is 0.4, probability of F is 0.5, and probability of E given F is what they are looking for. So the probability of E given F is zero. These numbers right here, are entirely irrelevant because E and F are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means that one prevents the other one from happening. And this says, find the probability of E given that F has happened. Well, if F has happened, E is impossible. So this is zero. J and K are independent events. Probability of J given K is 0.3. So find the probability of J. Well, given that they are independent events, that means that neither one affects the probability of the other. So if one happens, it doesn't change the probability of the other one. This is the probability of J if K has happened. Well, that's just the probability of J because K doesn't affect J. So probability of J is 30% or 0.3. Uh, 80, all right, so this is the hard one here. Problem 80, where, where are we at? Ah, it's this guy. Okay, uh, so We've got on February 28th, 2013, a field poll survey reported that 61% of California registered voters approved of allowing two people of the same gender to marry and have their have regular marriage laws applied to them. Among 18 to 39 year olds, approval rating was 78%, six in 10, so 60% uh, of California registered voters said that the upcoming Supreme Court's ruling about the constitutionality of Prop 8 was either very or somewhat important to them. Out of those California registered voters who support same-sex marriage, 75% say the ruling is important to them. Okay, I'm 100% aware that this is very hard to read. That is in fact why I assigned this problem. I want you to get practice reading stuff like this because this, this, could, this could have come straight out of a news report, right, a newspaper report. And that would, I mean, a news report that, that looks like this would cause your eyes to glaze over, I would imagine. But I want you to be able to understand complicated things like this, right? The ability to understand and analyze complicated things is a much greater is of much greater importance than remembering how to do statistics. To be honest, um, right? Understanding complicated stuff is a thing you're going to have to do all the time, every day, probably for the rest of your life. 
um, you know, that may be a little bit, a uh, little bit of an exaggeration, but not, not too much. Like the, the farther you go in the world, the more complicated things get. Anyway, here's how I'm going to go back through this. We're going to, we're going to see C, B, and A. I don't know why they put them in the order of C, then B, then A. I would think you'd go A, then B, then C, but hey, that's me. Um, and then we're going to, then we're going to go reread this. So uh, C is California voters who support same-sex marriage. I, I presume they mean the percentage of California voters who support same-sex marriage. Or no, I guess, I guess they're going to say, mm, this is this is oddly worded. They, they should really say C is, so pick a, Calif or pick a California registered voter. C is the event that the person that you picked uh, supports same sex marriage, same sex marriage, right? That's that's really the way this should be worded, given that the terminology that you're using from here on. We're going to ignore that. Just I think it's reasonably clear what they mean. So California registered voters who support same sex marriage. So when we go back and look at this, uh, sixty one percent of California registered voters uh, support same sex marriage, right? So probability of C is sixty one percent. Okay. That's out of all registered voters. B is California voters who say the Supreme Court's ruling about the constitutionality of Prop 8 is very somewhat, very or somewhat important to them. I'm going to shorten that to just say registered voters who say that the ruling is important. That's that's the way I'm going to, or important to them. So that's that's the way I'm going to read that. Um, where do we have that? <laughs> Okay, six in 10 registered voters said the Supreme Court's ruling was very or somewhat important to them. So probability of B is 60%. I'm mean, gonna assume that six in 10 literally means exactly 60%, even though it probably doesn't, right? It's probably just a, a, a rounding off. A California registered voters who were 18 to 39. So they don't tell us anything about what that number is. They just say, among 18 to 39 year olds, the approval rating for same-sex marriage was 78%, right? So that's, if we restrict ourselves to just 18 to 39 year olds, then the approval rating was 78%. So that means that the probability of C given A is 78%, which of course they ask us about later. All right, so let's answer these. Probability of C, that is the Proportion of um, California registered voters who support same-sex marriage, which we said was 61%. So 61% here. Probability of B is the, the proportion who say the ruling was important to them. So that is 60%. C given A, so that is support same-sex marriage, given that they are between 18 and 39. So among the 18 to 30, why is this not giving me a cursor? Among 18 to 39 year olds, the approval rating is 78%. So this is 78% here. B given C is the proportion of registered voters who say the ruling is important out of all of those who support same sex marriage. So out of the registered voters who support same sex marriage, 75% say the ruling is important to them. So probability of B given C is 75%. What is C given A? Just in words, not a, not a probability or a proportion, just what does this mean? So C is registered voters who support same-sex marriage. A is registered voters who are 18 to 39 years old. So that means that we are restricting ourselves to just A, and then within that, looking at C. So that means this is the voters who are, or the registered voters who are 18 to 39 years old, who then also support same-sex marriage. So C given A is out of the registered voters who are 18 to 39, the ones that support same-sex marriage. B given C, that means we're restricting ourselves to just C. That is the registered voters who support same-sex marriage. And then within that, B is the ones who say that the ruling is important to them. Probability of C and B. Well, here's where we're going to have to use the formula, right? So this is 
uh, use the conditional probability formula and then look at the information that we've got. So we have B given C. So I'm actually gonna, let me, let me pop open a uh, whiteboard here. So we know probability of, uh, do we have C given B or B given C? I forget, I'm gonna switch back for one second. We have B given C. Okay, so probability of B given C is probability of B and C over probability of C. Which if we rearrange this by multiplying both sides by probability of C, that turns in, that means that we get probability of B given C times probability of C equals probability of B and C. And of course, this is the thing that we're looking for. Um, and we, we have these other two, right? We have probability of B given C and we have probability of C. So we just have to multiply those two together to get B and C. So the probability of B given C was 75%. And the probability of C was 61%. Yeah, it was 61%. So we do 75% times 61%. And I believe that comes out to 45.75%. And so that's the answer. Uh, and by the way, um, I'm, I have a document here. Let me, let me link it real quick. Uh, I think I still got this up. Where's my, where's my Chrome file? Yeah, right here. Right. I've got everything with the, I've got all the, the answers in here, right? So here's number 80 and we're, we're right here. So you don't have to like memorize all this or go back to, to scribble down the answers. Uh, I'll just link the document, right? It's all here. Um, yeah. So uh, let me go back to explaining. When we were on H, uh, C and B is out of all voters now, all registered voters, it is the, the overlap between the voters who support same-sex same -sex marriage and the voters who say that the Supreme Court's ruling is um, important to them. This is not the same thing as C given B or B given as B given C, which was 75%, right? It's not true that 75% of all voters say um, that the ruling was important to them. It is just the ones who support same-sex marriage, 75% of those say the ruling was important to them. So what we have to do for C and, uh, or, or we already found C and B, right? So we know that 45.75% of all registered voters in California both think that, uh, both support same-sex marriage and say the ruling was important. C or B, so there we're going to have to use the we're going to have to use a uh, formula again. So let's zoop back over the whiteboard. So probability of C or B is probability of C plus the probability of B minus probability of C and B. Which although I, I've written it in the opposite order. Uh, right here, probability of C and B and B and C are exactly the same. Same thing for OR, by the way. B or C and C or B, totally the same thing. So we just have to find out what these things are and then, and then uh, add them up. So probability of C we've got, probability of B we've got, and probability of C and B we've got. So we just, uh, we just subtract them. Or just add these two up and subtract that one is what I'm trying to say. Back here. Oops, that's actually not the one I meant, but uh, you can see that we've got 61% plus 60% of this, right? So 75.25% is what we end up with. And I don't know if it's clear, um, but uh, or is always bigger than and, or I guess possibly equal, right? So C or B is always going to be bigger than C and B because or is one or the other or both, and this is just the both, right? So this has C or B contains and plus has some other stuff in it. So or is always bigger than and. Uh, are C and B mutually exclusive? No, absolutely not. 
uh, they are not mutually exclusive because you can have C and B, right? You can both be a registered voter who supports same-sex marriage and say that the ruling is important too, right? In fact, 45.75% of the registered voters said that that was true, which is a huge number of voters, right? There's what, 15 or there's probably what, 20 million voters in California, something like that, maybe more, uh, maybe more registered voters. So that's that's 9 million people, something like that. Definitely not mutually exclusive if it happens 9 million times. All right, 85. <laughs> Suppose you have eight cards, five are green, three are yellow, five green cards are one through five, three yellow cards are one through three. The world shuffle, you draw a card. So list the sample space. I, I take the sample, I, I, it wasn't exactly clear how they wanted the sample space listed. Um, I just listed all the cards, G1, G2, G3, G4, G5, Y1, Y2, Y3. That, that's my sample space. Probability of G is the, the probability of drawing a green card. So there are five green cards out of eight cards. So five out of eight. Probability of G given E. So that is probability of drawing a green card given that the number is even. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flip back to my um, answers here, so that I can explain a little bit more easily why the uh, why I've done that. So probability of G given E is two thirds. So the given E means that we are restricting ourselves to just even cards, right? There's two green, two even green cards, G two and G four, and one even yellow card, Y two. So among those three cards that we are restricting ourselves to, two of them are green, G2 and G4. So I get two thirds or 66.67%. Probability of G and E, so that's green and even. So that means that we're not restricting ourselves in any way. So this is out of eight, right? Because there's eight cards. Of those, two of them are both green and even, G2 and G4. So two out of eight, so 25%. G or E, you could use the formula here, but I, I think it's easier not to, right? So we could either get a green card or an even card or both. So that means we count all the green cards plus tack on all the yellow evens, right? So there's five green cards and one yellow even, Y2. And so any of those six count, so six out of eight. And G and E are not mutually exclusive. Uh, probability of G and E is two out of eight, not zero. Right, probably if, you, if they were mutually exclusive, it would be impossible to get a card that is both green and even, but it, it's not impossible. You can get G2 or G4. All right, problem 90. So here we don't have any sort of setup. Oops, I didn't I didn't flip back. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> I, I just scrolled down to 90 and started looking at it instead of uh, instead of showing you first. So here's the following scenario. Probability of C is 0.4, D is 0.5, C given D is 0.6. So before I even go any further, before I read any questions at all, I'm going to notice that the probability of C and probability of C given D are different. So C and D are dependent events. Now they, they do ask about that later, but that's a thing that you can look at right away uh, without doing any work. And notice that probability of C, or so probability of just C happening is 40%. Probability of C happening if D happens first is 60%. So that means that D affected C and they're, and they're dependent. Okay, C and D. So we, we wanna use the formula, right? So we're gonna do probability of C given D times probability of D, we get 30%. Uh, let, me, let me flip back. All right, so there we go, probability of C and D. So just, just like the formula I showed earlier with you know different letters on it, but same idea is, is, is this, right? So if we do this again, we get 30%. C and D aren't mutually exclusive. Probability of C and D isn't zero. There you go. And also, the, I could have said probability of C given D isn't zero as well, right? And that would that would also have been done. In fact, probability of C goes up if D happens, right? C goes from forty percent to sixty percent. So they're definitely not not mutually exclusive. In fact, D happening encourages C to happen. It doesn't it doesn't make it impossible. They are not independent events for the reason I said before. C given D does not equal C. Uh, C or D, probability of C or D is 
Same thing as it was before, probability of C plus probability of D minus the probability of the overlap. Add and subtract, you get 60%. And the probability of D given C is the, uh, again, we're using the formula, we're using this formula here, right, with, with D and C in it. Um, but now we're using the, the, the top formulation here. So I just do this, C and D divided by probability of C. 75 percent okay then the bonus question i believe that's is that the, the is that really all of it Andy? yeah it's the last one okay so this bonus question is hilarious and i have to say this chart actually used to be worse in a previous edition of the book because they didn't scale the bars in any reasonable way this is still a stupid way to make a chart don't make your charts like this um but so in this chart, there are numerous problems. Let's just start listing them and then we and we'll, we'll see how many there are. I, I can't count through them all right off the top of my head. So total, firstly, does not should not be a cluster in this chart. It's not appropriate to have the size of the total bars be in the same chart as the constituent portions of the total for a couple of reasons. Before I get into those reasons, let me just say, the biggest and most egregious problem with this chart is that they have put percentages and totals in the same chart. That is ridiculous. Don't do that. The reason not to do that is multifaceted. But I will say that firstly, just let's just look at, uh, at, at this cluster right here. It, the 18 to 34 cluster. Here we have 82, the bar for 82 is shorter, significantly shorter than the bar for 30. That's stupid. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, that's nonsense. You should not have percentages and totals in the same chart. So first and foremost, break the percentages and the totals into two different charts. Number one. Number two. The reason you don't have totals and, um, and uh, constituent parts in the same chart, it actually works okay for the, uh, for the sample size, right? The sample size of 1045 and, and you know, then we break those down into 82, 138, 226. That's actually fine. Um, although you really should make a stacked chart if you're gonna do that, right? Just have a total of 1045 and then you stack the 82, 138, 226 on top of each other in different colors so that you can see how the, the breakdown looks um, next to each other or uh, looks on top of each other. I, I didn't make one. I, I didn't remake this chart, but that's how I would do it. It's okay to break them up into different bars as well. That's not, that's not there. Where it, where, where it breaks down though is the percentages, right? You've got the total percentages. So they're saying that 60% disapprove and 40% approve. And then they're saying that um, the eight, in 1834, 70% disapprove and 30% approve. Now, that's fine. Nothing, nothing wrong with those numbers. The problem is visual here. The bar for 70 is higher than the bar for 60. So it makes it seem like there are more 18 to 34 year olds who disapprove than there are total people who disapprove, which is false. There's a higher percentage of 18 to 34 year olds who disapprove than the, the overall total. But when you make a bar chart, your bars should represent the relative sizes of the groups. And so it makes this group of 18 to 34 year olds who disapprove look bigger than the total group who disapprove, which is bad. That makes your chart confusing. So don't do it like that. What they should do instead is have three charts. I said two in the homework. I said I would make two charts in the homework, but rethink, but thinking about it, I should really make three charts. I would make one chart with the uh, one chart with the the uh, total total number of people, uh, and then within that chart, I would break it down into two different parts. Um, all right, excuse me, two charts, two charts with the total. That's what I'm trying to say here. I would make two charts um, 
that had the, the demographics of the people surveyed, right? I would have one chart with the ages, 18 to 34, 35, 44, et cetera, up to 65 plus, and then another chart with the male-female breakdown, right? Um, the reason I would want to do that is that it's weird. It, it, if you break down your groups, the, the groups of, of your total, you want to make it so that the groups that you break them down into add up to the total, right? By doing this, it makes it look like, well, this group plus this group plus this group plus this plus this plus this plus this should add up to the total. No, 18 to 30, the various age groups should add up to the total and the male-female breakdown should add up to the total separately. Therefore, you should have two different charts for them. And then I would make a third chart that had the percentage approval and disapproval for the various groups. Those can all go in the same chart. It's totally fine. You're comparing apples to apples there. You're saying among 18 to 34 year olds, here's the, the approval, disapproval. Among 35 to 44 year olds, here's the disapproval, approval, disapproval. Among the men, here's the approval, disapproval, right? So each of those groups adds up to 100%, which is totally fine. So I would make three charts, two charts for the demographic breakdown, and one chart for the approval disapproval for each of the groups um, that you're broken down into. I find this chart to be hilarious. This is presumably made by the people who wrote this book, professional statisticians slash teachers who should know better. <laughs> this chart is nonsense. Do not make a chart like this. Okay, that's the bonus question. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't make the chart, I just said in, in my answer. I will leave it to you to make the chart, but that those are the charts that I would make. All right, so there's, there's my answer. This this chart may actually be the worst professionally produced chart I've ever seen. It may be. It's it's certainly in the running. I'll I'll, I'll say that I would have to think long and hard to see if the, see if I had had any worse. But this is among the worst. All right. Uh, that is all I wanted to say uh, about this homework. I hope it was, uh, I hope you had an okay time doing it and had a good laugh at the chart like I did. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video now and I will see you in the next one.